Everybody, to On Pit Row, Steve Rockwitz and Charlie Turner with you live from the original Geno's Pizza and Grill. Very happy to hop right back onto our bench racing hotline. For the first time, we have from Speed Channel, Lee Diffie joins us. Hi, Lee. How are you? Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Well, absolutely. Uh, it's, Charlie and I have a huge love for road racing and uh one of the guys that uh, brings us road racing all the time on speed is you, and it's uh, nice to have you on. Uh, have talked to your counterpart uh, many, many times, Dorsey Schrader, and uh, just seems fair, I guess, that we give you a, a chance to uh, to call him out. So if there's anything that you, you need to get off your chest as far as uh, as your partner, now is the time to do it. Uh, we, give, we give Dorsey a, a pretty, pretty hard time each weekend. We have a lot of fun. Um, he's a great guy, and and uh, what a person to have on our team. Um, one of my favorite things is to spend time with Dorsey in the paddock and just seeing how, after all these years out of the cockpit, he's still uh, loved so much by the fans and just, just revered for what he achieved in his career. So to have someone like Dorsey on our team is a huge asset. Well, it's uh, it's interesting when you talk about ways that people get into the industry that we all love, racing and, and commentating on racing. And you come from a uh, an interesting background as well, uh, one that most people, uh, when they're going to go into race broadcasting, uh, teach elementary school. It's, it's a great way for you to have gotten started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, uh, I mean, that was, that was for a, a, a blink of an eye in my career. Um, and actually, I taught high school. Um, which was a bit tough because most of the kids were taller than me. So uh, <laughs> it, was interesting. it was interesting when disciplining them. But um, I, I grew up in a motorsport family, um, more motorcycles than cars. So it's been, it's been interesting the way that my career's gone, more cars than bikes. But uh, my father was very much into motorcycles. Um, my brother and I raced from a very young age, and I stopped in my mid-teens. My brother kept going. He was a state and national motorcycle champion, and so I was always around. I was around the motorsport scene always, and then it, uh, it continued when I went on to university, and I would I would go to awards banquets to make uh, speeches on behalf of my brother, who was uh, not really into that. He was quite an introvert, and uh, so I'd get up on stage as a young guy and grab his trophies and make some speeches on his behalf, and when I was in my early 20s, the, the, the local motorcycle club said, hey, um, we're looking for a commentator. Would you be available this weekend? And so very humble beginnings, you know, just uh, sitting in a, in a wooden tower with one microphone and, and, a, uh, and, a, and a radio, an AMFM radio to, to uh, fill, fill in the breaks, you know, when there were no racing uh, happening or at the lunch break. And, um, yeah, to now be living in a different country and working for speed and uh, just, it, 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 I mean, it's... It's been, uh, it's been quite the ride. It's been so enjoyable, and, and I uh, literally pinch myself every day that I'm here. Well, you know, you're talking to somebody who uh, really, the thought of moving to another city sometimes just uh, kind of makes me shiver, and yet you're able to move from Australia to the United States. Tell me about that process. I find that intriguing when someone, you know, moves halfway across the world. And, uh, you know, obviously there was some thought process there. I, I got to believe that it was a little bit of vacillating back and forth. Give me some of that as far as your background goes. Well, I, when I started uh, in, in the mid-1990s, in 1996, on network television in Australia. and was very fortunate to do the V8 supercars and things like World Superbikes and some Champ Car and a good cross-section of motorsport, as well as working on a show called Sports Tonight, which is Australia's equivalent of, um, say, ESPN Sports Centre. And, um, and I was able to have a, a lot of fun and a lot of experience in, in a very short three and a half years. And I did several overseas trips with Formula One. I did two, uh, two 24 hours of Le Mans in 98 and 99, which were great years. And it, it was then, Steve, that I just got the bug. It, it, it did me that I needed to be overseas. And, um, Australia is a wonderful country. It's my homeland. Um, but, it, you know, it, it, it does not have as much to offer as far as motorsport and, and other things as the Northern Hemisphere. And I just got that, you know, rather than being a big fish in a small pond, I was pretty happy to be a, a small fish in a very big pond. And, uh, it was at the end of 1999, I moved to, to the UK and I worked for the BBC. And uh, my friend, the late Barry Shane, who was a uh, world motorcycle champion, uh, he helped me get that job with the BBC. And I spent two years traveling the world doing world superbikes and some world rally and a little bit of F1 here and there and a good cross-section of domestic English motorsport. 
before um, being offered a job with CAR, uh, the old Chan Car World yeah. Series. And that, that's what brought me to America in 2002, and I did a season of that, and that's what then exposed me to Speed Channel, and then Speed offered me a job at the end of that, that uh, one season of doing the open wheelers. So um, it all, now having reflecting on it, it all went hand in hand really nicely, but you know, when, you, when you're in the middle of that, um, in the middle of that road, it, sometimes you can't see the end of the road, but it's been quite the ride, and uh, I have a terrific wife who has supported me uh, all along the way, and we now have a couple of young kids uh, who were born here in the United States, and um, it's, it's just been a wonderful journey. So what was the most uh, challenging part of, of moving from Australia? Of course, you had to jump off in, in uh, the U.K., but was there something that was that really, as you look back on it, was the most difficult thing to, to adjust to when you came to the to U.S.? You just have to, you just have to, obviously, sacrifice is a word that's used a lot, but sacrifice, uh, the biggest sacrifice that you have to make is, is lack of family time. So, yeah. you know, saying, saying goodbye to your mum and dad, and it doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter however young or old you are, um, saying goodbye to your mum and dad and your brothers and sisters and uncles and aunts and really good friends and knowing that you only, only see them maybe once or twice, if that, a year. Um, for the rest of your life, so it's a pretty big sacrifice to make, and uh, so that that's the biggest thing. That that's the biggest hurdle you have to get over. I mean, America is very similar to Australia uh, in many many ways. Australia is kind of uh, America's little brother, so the climate's similar. I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. I grew up in Brisbane, Queensland. The climates are very similar. It's hot and humid, and good summers, <laughs> and doesn't doesn't really snow in the winter, and so I mean. There's so many things that are similar to, to the way I grew up, to even living in North Carolina. So that that part's not difficult. Um, you know, learning learning the cultural subtleties and differences. You got to be very got to be prepared to be open open minded and open eyed and be flexible and uh, learn different phraseology. You know, I know that a lot of the viewers uh, and listeners have have fun with the way that I certainly pronounce different things like Mazda instead of saying Mazda and <laughs> anyway that's, that's that's part of the fun of all of it and um, you know, learning the different phraseology and terminology and, and uh, I, now I get ripped the other way, now I get ripped the other way from my Aussie mate saying oh you sound like an American, you're using American <laughs> terms and phrases and I say well I have to, that's where I work, that's my home now Yeah you know, you talk about uh, the Australian V8 Supercar Series and, and your beginnings there. I, I don't know of another series that American road race fans look at, especially stock car fans, look at and say, man, you know, that that is a great series. It, it, there, I wish there was something here in the United States which is really close to it. And I know you did a little bit of work with the Trans Am Series here in the U.S. W- would that be the series that you would think is most closely resembles what the, the Australian Australian V8 Supercar Series is now? Yeah, yeah. I would say Trans Am of a few years ago, you know, is probably the closest. Also, uh, maybe it's a bit of a stretch, but there were elements of, of the SCCA World Challenge that when I first came to America reminded me of it. But the thing that the thing that uh, massively differenti- uh, differentiates is that up until, uh, up until the end of this year, it's all going to change next year, but, you know, for the best part of, of two decades, two and a half decades, it's just been two manufacturers, Ford and General Motors with the Ford Falcon and a Holden Commodore, and that's been it. And, you know, they they start out life as a production car. They the, the, the tubs, the shells get taken to the various workshops and race teams and all the bracketry and various things get cut off. They get the roll bars inserted. They, they, they morph and morph into a race car. So there are... There are various series in this country that certainly reflect elements of their supercars but not to the same extent and um and, and the other the other really big thing steve is that it's a um just like now that we've we've clicked into nfl season um you know whether whether you're a green bay packers fan or a new england patriots fan you know it's that tribal mentality and it's about your team and that ownership and that's how it works in in aussie v8 supercars you're either a ford fan or you're a holden fan <laughs> and that's the way that you were that's the way that you were raised you know mum and dad either had fords and, and and typically it was dad you know your dad was either a ford man or a holden man and that's it you don't cross paths you're either yep. blue or red yep. and um and then when you go to the racetrack it, it's just like that so it's it, it would be no different to 
to watching two teams in the Super Bowl when you go to Bathurst or one of the classic VA Supercar races. That's the way it is. You are either Ford or Holden, and you will never change because that's the way that you were raised. We need to take a break, so we'll be back with more from Lee Diffie of Speed right after this. This is On Pit Row, the fastest show on Ustream TV. Hey, this is Regan Smith. This is Lee Spencer. This is Chad McCombie. Hi, this is Frank Kimmel. Hi, this is Joni McCheck. And you're listening to the fastest two hours in racing on Pit Row. This is On Pit Row. On Pit Row. The Bench Racing with Steve and Charlie blog on OnPitRow.com is a place to find the latest commentary on what is happening in the world of NASCAR. Bench Racing with Steve and Charlie is interactive, a place where reader reaction and comment is welcome. Discussion about whatever is happening in NASCAR can be found at Bench Racing with Steve and Charlie at OnPitRow.com. Find award-winning photography from NASCAR events around the country from our own stable of photographers. Bench Racing with Steve and Charlie is a member of the NASCAR Citizen Journalist Media. Media Hi, this is Carl Edwards here for RAD, the entertainment industry's voice for road safety. You want to make a difference? It's simple. Be responsible. Plan ahead. Designate before you celebrate. Friends don't let friends drive drunk. Public service message brought to you by the U.S. Department of Transportation, RAD, the National Association of Broadcasters, and the Ad Council. MyMetroToledo.net, the place to go when you want to know where to go in Metro Toledo. MyMetroToledo.net, the best pizza, tastiest ribs, most bodacious burgers? Find them at MyMetroToledo.net. Fabulous festivals, the hippest concerts, where's the Wi-Fi? MyMetroToledo.net knows... Whether you're a visitor or a veteran, when you want to know where to go in Metro Toledo, go to MyMetroToledo.net. Well, my game plan for Talladega is uh, to run well and to hopefully have a shot at winning the race like we did last year. But... uh... You know, we'll just have to see how that plays out. Uh, it's its own animal, uh, and it's been a very good track for us, but there's no guarantee of success at Talladega, no matter who you are. Well, my game plan for Talladega is... Welcome back, everybody, to On Pit Row. Steve Rockwitz and Charlie Turner with you live from the original Geno's Pizza and Grill. We're talking with Lee Diffie. And uh, one of the, the big stories, of course, in, in road racing here in the U.S., uh, and really in some degree, I guess it'll have uh, effect uh, worldwide in some ways, is the mer- upcoming merger of the American Le Mans Series and Grand Am. You've had a chance to cover both of them as well. Is this a merger? First of all, everybody... I don't know of anybody that's not happy about this upcoming merger. Maybe you know of someone who isn't, but is it going to work in your mind? Is this uh, something that has taken a long enough time to combat, you know, to to battle each other? Is this the right place at the right time for these two to come together? Am I, am I allowed to subtly cuss on the air here? Absolutely. Can I kind of sound like an Aussie? Sure. <laughs> Steve, this is the best bloody thing ever happened. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I had the fortune of, of being the MC and hosting the announcement yep. in Florida at Daytona Beach uh, at the Speedway. And, um, you know, I said, I said there it, it, to, to the people in the room and we were live on speed and on various internet uh, websites, I just said, this is a day that we thought we would never see. Mm-hmm. And it's so it was so refreshing when that news came out. And I was told uh, several days uh, prior to the announcement to get ready for it. And, and it was it's just great. I've worked in both series. I've known Dr. Don Pino since the beginning of the ALMS and when he came to Australia for the race of a thousand years. And uh, I've known Jim France a long time. And I know how doggedly determined both of that both of those gentlemen are in their respective ways for their respective businesses and series so it's pretty hard i mean that's why we thought it was a day that we'd never see because they're both um uh vehemently passionate about their respective series and they bring with them all of that uh, uh, business success so it was always going to be a, a hard fight to resolve and um you know i'm just so pleased that they've that they've now they're now holding hands. Um, 
it's going to be great. You know, we still don't know. We're no closer to knowing what the class structure is going to look like, what the race calendar is going to look like. Um, uh, Scott Atherton, the CEO of the American Le Mans Series, and uh, Ed Bennett, the CEO of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series, were just in Le Mans last weekend, meeting with the ACO, who, of course, run Le Mans, mm-hmm. and they are trying already, trying to uh, strategize what's it going to look like down the road. Are uh, Daytona prototypes going to be allowed to run at Le Mans? What happens here in the United States? Um, it was one of the big things to come out of the merger announcement that it's so important to both series to maintain that link to the ACO and to the 24 hours of Le Mans. I think that is the probably biggest question that fans have, that uh, journalists have, is what that class structure is going to be. And and you hit on it exactly. Is, is You wonder how these two groups, which split because of two completely different philosophies on how American road racing should be, how they're going to be able to integrate these two series together because a, a Daytona Daytona prototype is absolutely diametrically opposed, the theory behind it, to what a P1 car is. So how do you get those two pieces together? I, I think in the GT classes, not necessarily as difficult to try and piece those two series together, but I got to think in the in the DP class, the P1, the P2 class is going to be where it's going to be more difficult for them to try and put together a strategy. Exactly, exactly. And how do you how do you keep everybody happy? You can't. You're not. You're not going to be able to. But at least uh, for those te- uh, people and teams who have invested in a particular type of car, at least they're going to be able to run that for one, maybe two more years. Uh, it was the biggest question that we got asked, or it was the biggest discussion point uh, in that race meeting following the announcement, which was a couple of weeks ago when we were in at Master Raceway Laguna Seca, and saying. Well, what do I do? What, what, how, where do I put my money now? What do I do? Do I just hit pause? We had plans for 2013. Now we're going to change. People weren't whining. They were just wondering. Like, right. what, okay, what do we do? What, where do we go from here? Um, because I, I think everyone's going to be in a holding pattern for next year. There's, there's no other way to do it because you're just going to wait until uh, the, the new unified series and the board say, okay, here we go. For 2014, these are the cars that will be eligible. This is the direction we're taking. And then the teams and sponsors and everybody can make a decision on, on where they're going to go. I mean, it's not going to be easy, mate, um, but at least at least the two series are holding hands now. At least we were on common ground. At least we're going in the same direction. And it's been difficult for, for all of the guys that I work with on speed, for myself and Calvin Fish and Dorsey Schrader and Brian Till and Chris Neville and Jamie Howe. I mean, the list goes on. We've all worked in both series at different times and at the same time. And boy, oh boy, when you work in both <laughs> series at the same time, talk about feeling like piggy in the middle and right. being torn because... One series doesn't like you working on the other, but we're actually not working for the series. We're working for a broadcaster, and it's just so nice to know that there's that it's going to be a unified series. And and um, for for NASCAR and, Indi- and IndyCar, when this unified sports car series discovers what it is and and defines what it's going to be, look out because. That now you've got all sports car fans in North America going to be going to the same racetrack and going to be watching the broadcast and you've got manufacturers and sponsors that have one common goal and one series to focus on. And You know, look out. I think this thing can be massive. I think it can be really, really massive. We're talking with Lee Diffie. And one of the other interesting things, uh, at least in my mind, I, I have some weird thoughts on things, but uh, is tire manufacturers. I mean, you, you've got, again, a system with uh, with Grand Am where they've had one tire, the Continental Tire, for the last couple of years, and yet uh, when you go to ALMS, you have a different idea on what uh, tire manufacturers are going to do. So that's another one of those hurdles that you're gonna, that they are going to have to get over. But one of the things that that fans look at, I think, the thought of having these same cars being able to go to Daytona and run the 24 hours of Daytona, go to Sebring, which uh, you know th- that hasn't happened for years. Being able to go from Daytona to Sebring, and then eventually maybe even going to Le Mans, those three races with the same series, like you said, I think it's uh, Katie Bar the door is one of our stupid whatever the hell that means. I don't know, but uh, it's it's going to be an awful lot of fun. Oh, it's going to be fantastic. I mean, I wasn't around. I'm too young, but I, w- I wasn't around in those days when when the sports car season used to start with Daytona and, and Sebring. But I can't imagine anything better. I mean, 
start the season with the kind of Sebring, have Lamont in the middle and finish with Petit Lamont, I mean, that's, yeah. that's fantastic. And then and then you also get to do you know, the, the other circuits. I mean, there's just so many great racing circuits that both when both series combine, we, we can have the ultimate schedule. And um, fortunately, you know, the fans, eventually, the fans are going to be the winners. And it's great. And, you know, in this day and age where... where uh, you know, the, with the green movement and everybody has to be environmentally conscious and, and, and the manufacturers are, are going with their sky active programs and their eco boost programs and all of their various technology, it's all about relevance, right? So these cars, now the manufacturers can get excited about having one sports car championship. The cars on the racetrack, not all classes, but the cars on the racetrack are going to look like the cars in the showroom. They're going to be able to have the, you know, showcase their various technologies and I just think when everybody when everybody's rowing in the same direction, it makes sense. And and the sport, the fans, the sponsors, the manufacturers, the drivers, the teams, the television broadcasters, everybody wins. Every time a colleague of yours goes off uh, to play with his uh, friends at Barrett Jackson, you get to fill in and uh, play Formula One guy for a little while. And uh, I, I have I listened to the broadcast from Singapore, and. Uh, you know, it just amazes me, Lee, the the ability that you have to, and Varsha has the same same thing, and and all you guys, to to watch that thing. Basically, you're watching it on TV, and yet you're being able to commentate on it as if you're there. I I give you kudos for doing that. And the question I have about that is, tell me about the amount of preparation that you have to do to be able to do that. Yeah, a lot. I mean, you, we, we 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 all work very hard. Um, Sometimes my wife says to me, is there anything I can do so you don't have to be in the office so long? <laughs> but, um, uh, we, we, have, um, we have a wonderful team. Uh, I mean, to answer your question in short, we all do a lot of work. Uh, that's, that's, that's it, period. But we do have a wonderful team around us, uh, the production staff, the producers. Uh, we have a, uh, a guy, this uh, guy called Sean Kelly, who has a company called Statman, and uh, he is the best in the business. He doesn't just work for Speed Channel, he works for a variety of broadcasters and provides historical statistics and in-the-moment statistics. So we have that in addition to to what we watch on the screen and, and uh, what we get direct from the track. And, and I mean, there's, there's various information sources coming in. But uh, at the same time, you have to be ready to be able to react and respond and comment on anything that happens in a moment. And uh, as you know, you're a broadcaster. Things things change all yep. the time, and, and you have to have that uh, reactionary flexibility to, to, to be ready to change direction in a moment and try and tie in some historical fact or something that may be newsworthy of that week or the previous week or the previous race or the previous season or what might be coming up. So you're always dancing, but that, that's what makes it exciting and makes it interesting, and that's that's why we all love our jobs. All right. As somebody who is, uh, as we've already gone through, you've done V8 supercars, you've done Formula One, you've done uh, stuff for, with NASCAR, you've been to Le Mans, um, Bathurst, all these things. Is there something left on Lee Diffie's bucket list that you haven't been able to do as a as a broadcaster that's that's kind of gnawing at you that you want to do? I don't necessarily want to do it as a broadcaster, but I want to go to the Knoxville Nationals. I've cool. never been. I've, I, I've been to the Knoxville Nationals and sat there in three days of rain and was never able to see a car on the track a couple of years ago. <laughs> so you got to be careful what you wish for, I'll tell you. Yeah. But, but it's yeah, a, it, yeah, it yeah, is a hell of a it is a hell of a thing to watch, no doubt. Yeah, I'll, I'll get I'll get there one day. I just got to stop working. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One of these days, you know, it's funny you talk about uh, your wife asking you for help, and I'll never forget the first time that uh, my wife wanted to go down to uh, to Daytona for the race in July, and uh, she thought we were going on vacation. She says, "You know what? I I never had such a rotten time going to to any place in my life. You were working the whole time." I, well, I don't didn't know what you expected. But, uh, you know, yeah. going to the racetracks, I have a lot of fun, but it's a lot of work as well. And you do it as well as anybody does, Lee. I, I appreciate what you do. Thank you, Steve. Thanks. And it's been, uh, it's been wonderful to be on the show. I appreciate you giving me the time uh, to tell my story and, and uh, just to chat about the sport that we love. All right. Well, uh, we'll be listening. Have a good time. We'll talk to you again. Thank you, mate. Bye-bye. Right. Bye now. That was Lee Diffie. We will be back with more on Pit Row.
the fastest shooter.